everybody. Thank you for coming to our presentation, making research data, wow, that was loud. <laughs> Step back a little bit. Making research data publicly accessible, estimates of institutional and researcher expenses. My name is Jake Carlson. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Research Collections and Outreach at the University at Buffalo. And I'm joined by three of my colleagues on this project, Alicia Hoflick moore from the University of Minnesota, Jennifer Moore from Washington University in St. Louis, and Shauna Taylor from the Association of Research Libraries. As you can see, there are more folks involved in this particular project who could, weren't able to join us today. Uh, but I do want to call out Cynthia Hudson Vitali as our principal investigator from ARL. So um, this presentation is based on a report that was recently published by ARL, um, Making Research Data Publicly Accessible, Estimates of Institutional and Researcher Expenses. The QR code is on the screen if you're interested in getting a hold of that report right now. For the presentation, I'm going to start with covering some background information. And then going to turn it over to Shauna to discuss our methodology and then over to Alicia to go through our results. And then finally, Jennifer will wrap us up with a discussion of uh, and future investments. And we'll have some time for a Q&A afterwards. So to set the stage, um, I think we're seeing a real evolution in the environment around sharing research data, right? We have the Nelson memo that was released in 2022. This was um, uh, sort of an advancement of the, uh, the Holdren memo back in 2013. And the Holdren memo stated that uh, all federal agencies with a research budget, an R&D budget of 100 million or more, needed to develop a, a strategy and approach for making research data publicly accessible uh, from funding from that money. Uh, the Nelson memo goes one step further, or perhaps many steps further, in stating that all federal agencies now need to have such a, a strategy for making research data publicly accessible. And not just data that inform the results or, or inform publications, but all data that were generated as a part of that funding. We also saw the release of the desirable characteristics of data repositories in 2022. This is an attempt, I think, really to um, really define some of the infrastructure that's critical around making research data publicly accessible, uh, research data repositories, by defining what capabilities these repositories should have. This is also a tool for researchers to think about what they need to do in preparing their data to be able to be deposited and, and hosted by those repositories. And then finally, the NIH uh, in 2023 uh, started the, uh, the data sharing requirement. Um, previously, uh, before 2023, the NIH had required uh, awards of 50, 500,000 or more uh, to uh, share their data, um, make it publicly accessible. Um, and with the 2023 implementation, um, that uh, the threshold of, of uh, money was, was removed. And now all grants are required to include a data management and sharing plan as part of the proposal and try that plan to be implemented if the proposal is to be, rewarded, be awarded. So all of these uh, initiatives and events and, and changes uh, at the national level are obviously having an effect on institutions, right? So institutions are really looking at how do we prepare researchers, particularly with the NIH being the largest uh, funding agency for many institutions. How do we ensure that our researchers receiving these awards are prepared to follow through on the expectations? What is it they need to be aware of and be able to do in order to make that happen? What kind of support do they need? But we also need to think about our administrators. Research data is one of those things that isn't handled exclusively by one particular unit in the institution. There are usual multiple institutions, or multiple units rather, that come into play across the institution. And so a lot of institutions, including the University of Michigan, which is on the graphic here, are really starting to think about, well, how do we ensure that these units are working together more closely and collaborating in a way that helps not just the researchers to meet their obligations, but help institutions do this as well. Um, the institutions are also thinking about, well, what kinds of policies and services and infrastructure do we need to ensure that we're able to successfully uh, address the requirements that we're encountering? And although these are new initiatives and things are really heating up, I think these are not new practices. These, we've been working with how do we help researchers share their data since uh, you know, at least a, a decade now. And there's really questions about, okay, so we, we know that researchers are having to react to this. But what, what is the impact of those requirements on the ground? How are researchers thinking about this operationally uh, in, in trying to satisfy these agreements? We don't, we don't really have good data on, on this information, on, this, uh, on the impact of uh, these, these requirements. And so back in 2021, uh, six institutions with research data services and repositories got together to put together a proposal for the NSF uh, to look at developing an evidence-based model of, of research data sharing to better understand what the operations uh, impacted by these requirements were. 
And so we had three research questions as part of this particular project. First, how do institutions support research data management? What are the things that institutions have put into place, and how are those supported and, and um, uh, done uh, at, at the different institutions? Um, second, how do researchers prepare and share their research data? So what are their practices operationally as they develop and process and, and analyze their data? What are they doing to make their data uh, shareable and usable by others at the end of the project? We were particularly interested in where are researchers sharing their data and what metadata accompany that data set to uh, aid discovery and accessibility. And then finally, the third question, which is what we're going to focus on today, what is the institutional cost to implement these mandated public access to research data policies, right? We know there are costs, but these costs tend to be invisible or, or not well known. And because we don't have an understanding of what the costs are, it's really difficult for us to plan ahead and to think about what is a reasonable allocation of, of funding, what do we request, and how do we ensure that we're actually doing right by the researchers who have to follow through with these requirements. Uh, for our study, we took a look at a 10-year period between 2013, when the Holdren Memo was released, to 2023. So we're really looking at researchers who received funding from the NIH, NSF, or DOE during that time frame. Uh, and with the, uh, the closure of, of that grant coming before 2023, to get a sense as to, again, what were they doing and, and how were they impacted by, by these data sharing requirements. Um, for administrators, we looked at the fiscal year of 2021 and 2022, um, asking questions around what kinds of costs they saw in their particular units in support of research data sharing. Uh, so this really was a retrospective focused project, but I am pleased to say that we were funded to extend the work that we were doing by the IMLS, and the next phase of this work will include a prospective element. And now I want to turn this over to Shauna to go through our methodology. All right, so um, before we dig into our results, I'll share a bit about how we reached the conclusions presented in this report. Um, so if you are interested in more detail than what we briefly present here, we have a full methodology paper that accompanies the expense report. And a link to that report, as well as all of the outputs that we mentioned in this presentation, are on our last slide. Um, so our study used a mixed methods approach. First, our data was collected through surveys to uh, both funded researchers and administrators from units or departments that provide data sharing services or support. So for administrators, uh, we identified 138 units or departments across all of our six institutions that might offer these data uh, sharing services or support. And from this pool, we had a 50% response rate. And then from this, 58% or 58 administrators or 84% of our total respondents provided the expense data used in this report. Uh, so after surveying uh, the administrators, we conducted follow-up interviews with a subset of participants to clarify specifically the expense information uh, that they had provided in the survey. And when publicly available, we independently validated the salary information that they gave us. Um, so recognizing that institutions vary in their administrative structure, uh, the responses from administrators, administrators were then categorized based on their unit into one of four institutional service areas. Um, these areas here are uh, the research offices, broadly speaking, uh, libraries and archives, IT, and discipline-specific units, typically institutes, research centers, or academic departments. And by categorizing the units into these four broad service areas, we created a mechanism to compare services across the six different institutions with six very different structures. And as you will see, we also analyzed some of our results based on these four service categories. Uh, so for researchers, we also used a mixed methods uh, data collection approach. Our population consisted of researchers who were funded from the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health, uh, who were awarded and completed grants from 2013 to 2022. So 2013, as Jake said, at uh, the start of the Holdren Memo. And we narrowed down our participant, po our participant po population <laughs> even further and only sent surveys to uh, funded researchers with projects in one of five discipline areas, so biomedical sciences, environmental science, material science, physics, and psychology. And those disciplines were selected based on work being done at the time in the data curation network and also kind of areas of strength um, from our six participating institutions. Uh, so for, for the survey component of our study, we had an 8.4 response rate. 
so much lower than the administrators, and only 91 participants out of our total 255, or 36%, provided expense data used in this report. And notably, the questions on data management and sharing expenses were more difficult for researchers to answer than what activities they had done to make data sharing possible. And just as with the administrators, we had follow-up interviews with a select group of researchers and their research team uh, when available to really flesh out their responses around the expense information they provided. And we also validated, um, just as with the administrators, salary information when publicly available. So in our survey to both groups, uh, we asked, well, specifically to researchers, we asked you them to identify specific data sharing activities that they either did themselves or within the research team, did with institutional assistance, did with external assistance, or to indicate if they did not do the activity at all. So administrators were presented with a similar uh, list of data management and sharing activities. They were nearly identical and were asked simply which of these activities their unit supports. And here on this slide is just an example of four of those activities. Um, and, but as you can see, they are uh, grouped into a phase, which here in this example is the data retention, including preservation, archive, and long-term access phase. Um, so the research team, the RADS research team, came up with 27 of these data management and sharing activities, which we then categorized into five phases. And these five phases, they might look familiar. They roughly correspond to the research, data, project, and grants life cycles. And we felt it necessary to group all of these, like over two dozen uh, activities this way, to best contextualize them for both of our audiences, both uh, researchers and administrators. And notably within the five phases, we wanted to, uh, the respondents to think about data management and sharing with respect to the differences between phases three and four. So for instance, a researcher may have uh, shared data on a personal website, but may not have done any activities to ensure the data was ready for long-term uh, preservation and archiving. They might have thought that making or sharing data on request was sufficient for making uh, data broadly available, but it certainly wouldn't be for data retention. Um, so regarding our actual expense-specific questions, what did we ask from the participants? For administrators, we asked for the number of personnel who supported any of our 27 data management and sharing activities, and uh, the percentage of time each person spent on these activities, and then their salaries again. So we asked for annual infrastructure costs, which range from subscription fees, software fees, hardware costs, and then other miscellaneous costs they might have had. And for researchers, we requested similar information, but we asked for total infrastructure costs and percent effort from personnel over the entire grant period and not annually. All right, so now I'll turn it over to Alicia. All right, so as Shauna mentioned, we asked a lot about the expense. So we also asked about activities, and we're happy to talk about our findings in terms of who's doing what and how they're doing it. Um, but what I'm going to focus on are the costing results. So I'm going to start by talking about the cost, uh, first, of administrators. So what does it cost to support these data management and sharing services? Then to researchers, what are their costs to support their funded projects that they're incurring individually? Um, and then we'll talk about a few extensions of this work. So first, how would these costs scale at an institutional level if we want to figure out what's the total cost institutions are facing to support data management and sharing? And the second extension is whether there are a relate whether there's a relationship between the activities or the actions researchers take, specifically in regards of engagement with institutional services, and how that relates to or associates with their cost of data management and sharing. So I'll be presenting each of those. Um, so let's start with administrator expenses. And so these are the expenses reported by administrators um, for the cost of providing support for data management and sharing. So the labor costs, the staff costs of supporting those data management and sharing activities. Um, so we calculated the overall annual cost for each of those four institutional service areas Shauna mentioned before. So the research offices, libraries, IT and computing, and institutes and centers. 
So in the lightest blue bar is the total cost. Um, in the medium blue is the cost for staffing. And in the darkest blue is the cost for infrastructure. And so just noting in this graph that libraries and IT are the two with the largest bars. So they were facing the biggest cost of providing support for DMS services. Um, and I'll note that these are current expenses, um, but this does align with the COGR report on um, anticipated future cost burden of these policies too. So we found um, similar results. I'll also note that the staffing cost, so just looking at those medium blue bars, is also much higher for the libraries um, than the other units, and infrastructure costs we found were more similar across the units. Turning to researcher expenses, um, I'm going to shift to funded researcher expenses. So what are they individually incurring to support their own research data management? And so just to give you some context in our sample, so we had NIH, NSF, and DOE in our participant population, um, but our respondents were predominantly NIH-funded researchers. Um, NSF, we only had three DOE respondents. Um, and so just to give you a sense of the size of awards in our sample, our NIH award on average was 2.7 million, and our average NSF award in our sample was just under 500,000. Um, one thing we anticipated is that there might be differences in data management and sharing costs based on the size of the award. And so we split our sample into three different categories based on their overall award size. Um, and so just to give you a sense of who is in this category and their size of their awards, um, this is presented in the table before. So the lower 25th percentile, these are our smallest awards in our sample. Um, these are under 300,000. Um, mostly NSF. The middle 50 contains all of our three funded research groups. That's about 300,000 to 1.4 million. And then our upper 75th percentile, these are the biggest awards in our sample, and those are primarily NIH, ranging from 1.5 to a very, very large number. <laughs> um, so uh, keep these groups in mind, and I'll be presenting the next slides um, based on these groups. Okay, so overall expenses, so when we look at our entire sample, the average cost per funded project was about $30,000. Um, you can see on the left that when we split that by our sample, so in the lightest blue is our upper 25th percent, our biggest grants, in the darkest blue is our smallest grants, um, you can see that this scaled propor proportionally by um, grant size, so slightly more expensive for those larger grants, slightly less expensive for the smaller grants. Um, but one of our goals was to use this data to help us project and plan for the future. So if we're telling people to budget for data management sharing, usually that's in terms of a percentage of a grant. So one way we wanted to look at this data is what was the proportion of what they spent on data management sharing relative to the size of their grant. And so this is what this graph is on the right. And so we found across our sample it was about 6%. Um, which is in line with, I know, guidance that um, my university was um, sending to people, too. Uh, but one thing that's uh, extremely notable is that um, this varied widely across grants. Um, and so DMS expenses for those smallest awards uh, was accounting for a much larger percent. Um, and so that, on average, was about 15% of their grant total, as opposed to looking at the largest grants in our sample, it was only about 1% they were spending on data management and sharing. So in terms of cost burden, this is hitting those smaller grants much harder. Okay. Um, so the first extension we want to look at is asking the question, now that we know the cost for providing services for each of these administrative units, we have a sense, an estimate of the cost per project, how would this scale? We have a lot of units, we have a lot of projects. Um, so we tried to estimate this by um, scaling the individual project researcher cost at each institution by the total number of funded NIH, um, NSF, and DOE projects yearly, and so this was based on our population we pulled the data from. And then we added that to the combined institutional expense, so summing across the average expenses for each of those four service areas that Shauna mentioned earlier. 
Um, and so this returned for each of them a total scaled institutional expense with the total burden to institutions, combining both the cost of providing these services and the cost faced by our researchers in doing their work for data management and sharing. So this is a table of the um, total cost for each of our six institutions. I also have the total uh, federal sponsored research expenditures there too as a reference. Um, and so you can see it ranged from about $800,000 to over six million with an average about $2.5 million. Again, this is what we're currently spending, uh, estimate of what we're currently spending on data management and sharing. We also have a strong reason to believe that these are underestimates. So even though it seems like a big number, an underestimate of what the true cost is. Um, there's a few reasons, and we can talk about these in more detail uh, in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but a couple of them is in terms of scaling, especially on the administrator end. We know there are more institutional units that are incurring costs than what we've averaged here. Um, so especially in the category of institutes and centers, um, at a place like Minnesota, which is where I'm at, um, there are a lot of different independent institutes and centers that their costs are summative. So just averaging all of them is going to underestimate those costs. Um, likewise, on the research side, our institutions get a lot more funding than from those three funders. Um, and so we're not taking into account all the other projects that are incurring costs for data management and sharing. And also, we know that even in that space, there are two institutions um, in our sample that had separate medical schools, so we didn't even consider the grants um, that were awarded to those schools, and those are largely, likely large grants that have high costs. So keeping those in mind. All right, so um, moving on. So the, the last piece of the results I'll be presenting on is about how behavior of researchers and their engagement in activities relates to the cost um, that they incur for data management and sharing. So as Shauna mentioned before, we asked researchers about each of those 27 activities and asked them how they did it. Did they do that on their own? Did they get help from an external support, an agency, or an external repository? Or did they do it with institutional support, such as with the libraries or with IT or with um, another office? And so we wanted to look at whether the number of activities they report doing these ways was related to their total data management and sharing costs. Um, so we looked at that and we found that for the number of activities they uh, reported doing on their own, there was a positive and statistically significant and a regression relationship between the costs. So the more activities they did on their own or in their lab, the higher their individual data management and sharing costs were. We did not find a statistically significant relationship between external support, although you can see that trend is in a similar direction. And we also didn't see a statistically significant relationship with internal report. But it's worth noticing uh, that that relationship seems to be in the opposite direction. So it seems that unlike on own, that has a much more um, negative slope. So seeming like potentially uh, there might be cost savings um, by doing institutional support. Um, and although it's hard to see on this graph, I will note that um, most researchers reported doing activities on their own. Um, and so this was predominantly uh, the most common response. And you can kind of see that in these graphs with how the number of activities is much more spread on the on own and scrunched uh, towards the smaller numbers on external and institutional support. Finally, we looked at whether the location in which researchers um, were sharing their data is related to their overall data management sharing costs. And so we asked researchers where they shared the data um, as a result of their funded project, and they were able to select as many as they wanted. Um, so, and they reported sharing their results in many places. So most people selected more than one of these options. And what we did is we looked at average expenses across each selection. Um, so we found that researchers who used an institutional repository, and there were 16 in our sample that selected that and reported DMS costs, um, had expense of about $7,000, uh, whereas those, if we averaged all those other bars that did not use an IR, that was about $35,000. Um, the other thing to notice here is when we look across all those different areas, the IR bar is also the lowest in terms of cost. Um, so I do want to caution about causality. Um, so we don't have any uh, 
evidence for cause. Um, but it is worth noting, too, that in terms of institutional costs, like an institutional repository is something the library invests um, a lot of uh, money into in terms of staffing and infrastructure, and the libraries were also having highest institutional costs. And so there is potential, and we'll talk about this, um, Jennifer will, in a moment, um, for uh, making better use of those resources and helping researchers um, take advantage of the support their institutions offering. So on that note, I will hand it over to Jennifer to talk about future investments. Hello, I am here to talk about the future, although I will not talk about AI. Sorry, everyone, if you came here for that. So um, first, I want to talk about uh, what administrators told us in terms of their anticipated future investments in the next five years in data management and sharing. And I'm just going to decode our graph here for a moment because you've seen these colors many times and we're using them interchangeably. So in this case, planning and design is in our darkest color and project closeout is the uh, lightest color. I also want to reintroduce you to a concept Shauna already described, which is breaking our administrative units down into buckets or more like uh, aggregating them into buckets so that we could talk about them in, in a useful way. So what you're seeing in these graphs are uh, the percent of responses to different phases of the research cycle um, by the bucket that they're a part of. So on the top is institutes and centers, then information technology, libraries, and research offices. So when we asked what they considered um, they would spend in the next five years above what they're spending now, so relative to what they're spending now, um, we, their potential responses included, we anticipate no uh, additional expense beyond what we spend now. And as you can see, um, there were some respondents that uh, responded to it in that way. Uh, we're seeing it mostly in research offices and institutes and centers. Uh, the, other, the next option uh, was a minimal uh, increased spending. And um, again, we see responses across the board here. Then a moderate increase spending. Uh, we're seeing the same trend here. Fewer, uh, fewer research offices saw that, first saw that they would be spending a moderate amount uh, on their, above what they're spending now on their DMS. Um, and then when it came to the option of a su substantial increase, uh, it was only libraries uh, that had a significant uh, response here. Uh, almost half of the respondents uh, described spending um, more, uh, substantially more on um, data retention, so archiving, uh, preservation, and long-term access, as well as making data broadly available at a lower extent and um, data collection management and uh, storage. Uh, we also see that uh, the IT bucket uh, anticipates spending a substantial amount more. 13% uh, of those respondents saw, saw doing that um, as well. So those were our kind of outliers. But we can see, you know, regardless of the, of the fact that there are, isn't a lot of um, responses in this substantial amount uh, category, all of these areas are intending to increase their spending somewhere uh, at, at, at some level in the next five years. So now I am going to talk about what we would like researchers to consider, um, what we're suggesting to them. Uh, first of all, you know, as Shauna, I'm sorry, as uh, Alicia pointed out, uh, institutional resources uh, may be a, a more economical way to meet data sharing, um, so data sharing requirements. So we want to encourage researchers to make use of the institutional resources that are available to them. Uh, it, it will reduce their personal burden uh, in, in data sharing and management. Uh, we also uh, want to implore that they really think about what the cost base 
for uh, data sharing will be uh, when they're doing their planning. And if that is not uh, funding that they have available to them without putting it into their budget to make sure those numbers are in the budget uh, when on submission. Uh, for institutions, uh, we really think it's going to be increasingly important, especially as the requirements are coming more into effect, that we invest even more in services and infrastructure. We um, also, and I can't really emphasize this enough, I mean, all of our institutions have had data services in place for over 10 years, and it doesn't mean that our researchers know about them. So I can't overstate the importance of investing in communicating what we have and how we can support data management and sharing. And, you know, it, it can't be a side thought. It has to be part of the strategic plan to make sure that our researchers know that we're, we have these resources. And also, we need to be uh, more uh, collaborative with one, an one another in other administrative units so that we can um, increase the efficiency of resources that are available to researchers, um, as well as just be able to talk cohesively about what the institution can offer. Okay, so we learned a lot uh, through this research, and uh, there are still things that we want to explore. Um, among those, that w one thing we, that became very clear is it was hard for researchers and even administrators to, to parse out what good data management and sharing practice is versus what good general, good scientific practice is. So, like, making um, data management and sharing activities critical and distinct set of practices so that we can talk about them in a way that is more measurable than it is today is really important. We also um, really had a hard time uh, assessing staffing expenses. Again, it's be a bit because we don't know how to separate things out well, and we want to look more at, uh, at doing that better and having a more structured way to talk about it. Oftentimes, our PIs would not even include themselves in their calculus of what data management and sharing was, and we'd have to go back and find that information. So we really need to have a way to, to do that in a way that people know how to do it. Um, and we want uh, to expand to other disciplines. Every institution involved in this research is an R1 institution, and we really want to expand past that, R2, liberal arts, et cetera, so that we can see how the landscape looks when we kind of change our perspective. Um, and also, our, our focus was very STEM-oriented, and we would like to expand uh, to look at more disciplines as well. Um, we are, as Shauna mentioned, uh, mo moving on to phase two or have moved on to phase two of this work. And um, that is funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And so we will uh, be digging deeper in some areas and refining our methodology and also expanding. I do want to note here, uh, there are, of course, limitations in our research. There always are limitations in research. But what we think we've brought uh, to this conversation is a very critical first step in understanding uh, what it costs to do data sharing. And that is something that was not measurable before we started. So we think that that's a very valuable uh, path to start down. Although what we learned too is that it's so complicated that, you know, sorry if you thought you were coming here for the full solution. Don't have it but we're working on it. Um, and then uh, also we feel that what we do have is a lot more uh, fuel for administrators to make decisions about resource allocation uh, than before, uh, you know, really being strategic about how we invest. Like these people had to answer that question without having any data like this in our survey before, like what do you anticipate spending? Well, it's really hard to measure if you don't really know what it costs. Um, and then also, we 
we feel our methods could be used as a foundation uh, to, for other institutions to evaluate their expenses uh, themselves and uh, understand what it's costing them locally on data sharing. Okay, so uh, we are coming to the end here of, uh, of our prepared presentation, and we'll take questions and answers, but um, I do wanna tell you that RADS too, part of the expansion is to bring on other institutions, and soon we'll be doing a call for participations for institutions that wanna be a part of the research. Um, and that call is gonna go out in about mid-May, I'm sorry, mid-April, nobody panic. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and we'll also have an informational session in the next few weeks so that institutions can learn more about what being a participant would, would look like. But what I can tell you is that the incentive to participate is a complimentary two-year membership in the Data Curation Network. And um, if you are interested or you know someone else that you think would be a good fit, please you know, let us know. And uh, with that, I think we are ready for questions. I am so grateful and interested in this work. I have a thousand questions. Uh, but one of the things I was struck by is how much of this research was predicated on staff effort time, and you've talked about that's something you want to explore more. Can you share more about how you've kind of done that assessment or calculation of staff effort and time, apparently divided by salary? Okay. I think it's on. Okay, it's on, great. Um, Yes, great question. So we, um, in terms of how we collected it in the survey, we did ask for um, for administrators. So people name the, um, we did up to five and we're extending this in our next iteration, but people who work and provide that data management support and then their salaries and their percent time. So that's a lot of information asked. We did the same thing um, for researchers. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, sometimes they didn't include themselves. And so being mindful of that. Um, so that was our survey questions. Uh, we had options for salary versus hourly. We also then went back um, and in our interviews, we asked them again. For those of us who had public institutions, we looked up people's salaries. Um, and so there was a lot of legwork um, in terms of getting a good salary estimate and then getting um, a percent time estimate, and then it was calculating that out. Um, one of the things that we want to be more mindful of, especially in the researcher side, is for how long of the grant duration the different staff were employed and whether that percentage of effort changed over time. That's something we didn't think about, um, and hindsight's 2020, so that we'll, we'll be thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> I would also say that we, we did do interviews to try to get a little bit more detail as to the kinds of, of uh, the, first of all, the, to understand the salary and the percentage of effort, but also to understand well, what, what kinds of activities were being done. We're still going through our interviews to, to learn more about that. Um, I will say, I think Jennifer pointed out that it was really difficult for researchers to, to extrapolate on this. I think a lot of this is seen as simply doing good science. And if you think about it, research data management isn't new. It's, it's the perspective and the scale and the scope that's new, right? Researchers have always managed their data for their own use to extract the value for their findings. What they're being asked to do now is to try to make those data sets useful for other people. And, and that's sort of the new aspect that hasn't really sort of, we didn't really see it as much in terms of front of mind kind of work um, in the way that I, I think we would hope to get to uh, as we go forward with this kind of requirement. Thank you. Uh, Christine Borgman, UCLA, and I've been following your work, and thank you for opening up a very large black box, because we've known this is a very expensive process, and we've been doing empirical work on data sharing and reuse for a very long time. So I have two questions, one, uh, both of which may be for like the next phase of research. One is to what extent did you look at the types of data? 
because we know, for example, that you know, high production throughput automated data are fairly cheap to, pr to preserve and manage, where the small handcrafted are very expensive, which probably explains your, 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 the difference in your chart here. So to what extent do you find the type of data is a factor? And second, how much are you looking at the degree of curation? I mean, we have, we've seen cases where you can take a dirty spreadsheet and dump it into this repository, and that's cheap. Or you can do really elaborate, full documentation processing, really curated, useful uh, for, for particular purposes, and that's very expensive. So those are, there's a lot of variables in here I think you haven't tackled yet, and I hope you will in these next phases. Uh, thank you. Yes. And <laughs> I agree with you. And yes, those are all uh, great points. I will say a little bit about data type. We did not um, look specifically at data type in this work. We were hoping to pull this a little bit out by discipline, um, but it turns out the uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, variation was larger than the between disciplinary variation, as you might um, expect. And so we don't have any evidence of that, but that exactly is a question in our future surveys, is looking at data type, because you're exactly right. Some of the efforts um, and data types vary vastly in the amount of effort um, and cost it would take to put into it. Um, yeah, I think yeah the, about curation. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, one, one of the other points that I think we, we started to see a bit in, in the results is that there are some uh, research projects that you know, generated data because it was a necessary part of, of getting to the findings and, and uh, you know, publishing them and such. But there are some projects that really were focused on the act of generating data uh, as, as sort of a, the central core component. And for those, I think, you know, I, I don't know that we're prepared to say anything, you know, in detail, but we did sort of anecdotally notice that those tended to be the ones that had a greater expense in terms of having to, to work with data management, obviously because that was much more of a focus of that particular project. So I, I think there is something definitely there to explore. And I will say, our, um, we do have the data uh, publicly available in uh, WashU's repository, and we do have um, both that, uh, how, how, where they selected their data, and also, I think, a, a coded um, what kind of repository it was. And so, um, I don't think we specifically looked by whether it was a curated repository or not in cost, but that's, I think the data are there, and I, I'm gonna go look after this. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned um, that you found a correlation, at least, between institutional repositories and lower cost. Um, totally understand that you don't have causative evidence. Do you have, like, a causative story? Like, do you have in mind why that would be? Because I wonder if it's just that there weren't that many people who picked it. Yeah, uh, I'm a statistician by training, so it's hard to not um, <laughs> to, to weave a story, but I think there's a lot of reasons, right? It could be that um, institutional repositories are well suited for um, the kind of data that uh, smaller grants or people who are share spending less money are putting their data in. So institutional repositories aren't necessarily designed or have the capacity for some of the large data that we may be seeing in the um, grants that are spending a lot on data management and sharing is one. Um, another possibility is it could be people don't have the money for it and so they put it in institutional repositories. Another one could be that it actually saves them a lot of money, especially you know our institutions are all curated institutional repositories. So that labor of curation um, we are doing or we are offloading um, a little bit institutionally. So I think we don't have evidence to you know, sway those, um, but certainly we want to pursue the one um, because we have you know, strong value in our work um, that it is beneficial. Thanks. Uh, just one more question, and I apologize deeply if you actually explained this in your presentation and it just went over my head. Um, why don't the infrastructure and personnel costs total to the total? Are there like overlapping costs? And what are some examples of where that overlap might be? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, it's because sometimes people reported missing data, and so it was how we're aggregating. Um, so some people had infrastructure costs and not total costs, and then when you sub it, yeah. That's a great question. 
I just wanted to opine a little bit about her first question because it was also something that I noticed when looking at your slides. Um, so I, I wonder if some of the lower cost in the institutional repository um, is actually reflected in the library's spending on um, staff and uh, infrastructure. But the other thing that I was thinking, um, at least for Caltech, where I am, um, up to this point, um, any time we've had a researcher want to put their data in our Caltech data repository where they have hit our cap and they're going to have to pay for the storage, they've said, thank you, no. So I also wonder if, if, that, if some of like institutional policies are, are shaping some of that. And this is actually an area where we're doing work so that um, our institutional repository is more of an answer to our researchers' data management and sharing needs. Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that for this particular project, we were looking at costs to the researcher as reported by the researcher themselves, right? So there certainly are costs to institutional repositories, but they're not usually borne by the researcher unless you get the certain threshold, depending upon the policies of the institutional repository. So in a way, it's, it's a little masked. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there are obviously costs, but they're not necessarily front of mind for the researcher. Out of time. So thank you all so much and we're happy to chat afterwards.